one. Hello, students. This is Mrs. Bielsen, and today we are going to finish the Newton's Laws lecture. We ended on Thursday, excuse me, on Wednesday, November 6th, talking about tension. So we're defining types of forces that we might encounter in problems dealing with Newton's second law. Well, all of Newton's three laws anyway. So we define tension as just a name for a force that's exerted by a string or a rope or even um, a wire. And um, we're not really concerned about how tension works on a microscopic scale. We're just focused on the macroscopic issue of a contact force by a rope or a string tied to something, as in this case, in a, tied to a bucket. Um, we're also interested in naming the support force of a surface supporting an object. So when we have a support force, like a tabletop supporting a box or a floor supporting um, your feet and your body when you're standing on the floor, we're going to call that support force a normal force. And we're using the word normal in its mathematical sense, normal meaning perpendicular to. Anytime there's a support force, the support force ends up being perpendicular to the surface that's supporting the object. Um, <clears throat> when the object is at rest on the surface, as we talked about standing on your bathroom scale in your bathroom, the normal force is equal to the pull of gravity on the object. That's kind of the usual everyday experience. But there are times and circumstances when the normal force is not equal to the object's weight. If you imagined standing in your bathroom on your bathroom scale, reading your weight, the bathroom scale would read your weight. But if you then put a heavy backpack on, you would find that the scale reads a larger force than your weight. It's not exactly your apparent weight as we discuss in terms of being in an elevator, accelerating up or down, or being on the um, cannibal ride at Lagoon. It's more like you have added extra force to your feet um, by virtue of this backpack. And so the normal force of the floor on your feet has to be bigger to support the extra weight. That would be like this picture to the very right where the box is sitting on the table and then you're adding an additional 50 newtons of force downward on the box. So the normal force of the table supporting the box has to be bigger than the weight of the box. Then conversely, the middle picture is an, a situation where the normal force is smaller than the weight. This hand is lifting up on the box. So there's, you could sort of imagine that some of the support of the weight of the box is the normal force and some of the support of the weight of the box is this hand sort of holding the box. There, the upward tension in the string <clears throat> and the upward normal force are combining to support the weight of the box. So usually an object at rest on a perpendicular or on a, on a horizontal surface experiences a normal force equal to its weight, but there are special cases where the normal force is more or less than the weight of the object. It's something you need to be aware of. So we've already looked at the vocabulary for um, all of Newton's laws, and I refer you to the word wall in the classroom. We want to discuss two particular forces that occur in real life. Um, we have ignored them up until now, but um, because we live in the real world and friction occurs in the real world, we now want to introduce the effects of kinetic and static friction. So friction is a force that always opposes the motion of two surfaces that are in contact with each other. Right now we're going to focus on solid objects sliding on solid surfaces. So we're still ignoring air resistance. Um, or we could use the word drag force for that. Um, there are two types of friction, kinetic friction and static friction. And static friction is the force that's exerted by one surface on another when there's not yet motion between the two surfaces, or there's no motion between the surfaces. Static friction is friction that's opposing the intent to move. So you can imagine trying to move a couch across a carpet, and you start pushing that couch to the right, but the couch doesn't move. And the couch doesn't move because there's so much friction between the carpet and the legs of the couch that it meets the 
it is equal to the force you exert on the couch. More, of, more on that in a second. So if you push hard enough, the couch begins to move. You have probably experienced this in your life. And now the sliding of the couch is opposed by kinetic friction, kinetic meaning moving. So if the thing is not moving and you're pushing on it and there's friction, we call that static friction. If the thing is moving and there's friction opposing the motion, we call that kinetic friction. The friction force depends on really two things. So, or at least for this first model for friction, the force of friction, whether it's static or kinetic, depends on two things. That is, what are the two surfaces? So is it sandpaper and wood? Or is it um, ice and, I don't know, um, metal uh, skate? So the types of surfaces, essentially like how slippery are the surfaces or how easily do they move past each other? And then it also depends on how much the surfaces are mashed together. So how much force is pushing the two surfaces together as they try to slide past each other. So that's reflected in the equation for static and kinetic friction. Kinetic friction, so kinetic friction force, let's see if I can highlight this, maybe not. Kinetic friction force is equal to this strange symbol. Um, it looks kind of like a U, but it's Greek letter mu, and mu subscript K to indicate kinetic. So the coefficient of kinetic friction is this symbol mu subscript k. And the amount of force of kinetic friction is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction, that's this, times the normal force. Normal force is that support force of surface supporting the object. So it indicates the amount of force mashing the two objects together. The coefficient of kinetic friction is the number that indicates the slipperiness or the frictioniness between the two surfaces, and the normal force is the number that indicates how much they're mashed together. So kinetic friction force is a constant, and it depends on those two factors, the stickiness or slipperiness of the two surfaces, coefficient of kinetic friction, and the normal force, the mashing of the two surfaces together. Static friction force is a little different. Static friction force will build in response to your attempt to slide an object. Static friction force is variable, but there's a maximum static friction force. So it's kind of the breaking point. You can imagine pushing that sofa and you push and push harder and harder to the point where you break the static friction between the legs of the sofa and the carpet and the sofa starts to slide. So that breaking point indicates the maximum static friction force between the two surfaces. Maximum static friction force, you'll notice these equations look really similar. Maximum static friction force is equal to the coefficient of static friction <clears throat> between the two surfaces times the normal force. So again, it, it depends on the same two factors, the type of surfaces and the normal force, but the coefficient of static friction is always larger than the coefficient of kinetic friction, even for the same two surfaces. It always takes more force to break the bond for static friction and get an object moving than it does to keep it moving. So here are some typical coefficients of friction, and these are measured quantities. They are unitless. They are kind of factors or fractions. Um, if you have cast iron sliding past cast iron, the maximum amount of static friction is given by the coefficient of static friction of 1.1. Once you have cast iron sliding past cast iron, you can keep it sliding um, with a kinetic friction that's indicated by the coefficient of kinetic friction of 0.15. This is a table in your textbook, and we'll refer to it as we need to for solving problems. But you can see that different surfaces interacting with different surfaces have different coefficients of static and kinetic friction. You'll also see that the coefficient of static friction is always, with one exception, bigger than the coefficient of kinetic friction. The one exception is nonstick coating on steel. So the next thing we need to do is some example problems, and that will be the next video.